Let's imagine that we've got a parachute jumper who's just jumped out of an airplane. Uh, the person is falling. They've, they've got a backpack, uh, a, a, a parachute on there, so don't worry. They're going to open the parachute. No one's going to get hurt. Uh, the person is falling under the influence of gravity. So one of the forces acting on this person is her weight. So she's got a force acting downward of the weight that's equal to mg. But there's also air resistance. So in this case, we are not going to ignore air resistance. The, the relationship of air resistance to uh, velocity can be a complicated thing and depends on the shape of the object and uh, things like that. So we're going to assume that the frictional force, the drag in this case, the drag, actually has a form of b, some constant, times v squared. So what does that mean? When the velocity is zero, there is no drag force. When the velocity is small, there's very, very little drag force. But as the velocity increases, the drag force increases. So let's take a look at this and uh, see what we can figure out. So we know that F equals MA. F equals, what's the total force? Well, let's say, in this case, we'll say that because the motion is downward, we'll, we'll say that downward is positive. So we have the net force in the vertical direction is, we've got mg, and then the drag is going to give us a minus bv squared. And we know that this must equal the mass times acceleration. All right, well, this is very interesting. Um, let's see if we can solve this. Remember, acceleration is the first derivative of velocity. What does this tell us? This is telling us the rate of change of the velocity. Over here, when mg is larger than bv squared, which we expect it to be when the velocity is small. So when the velocity is small, the drag force is small, we expect gravity to be larger than the drag force. In that case, m dv dt is going to be a positive number, which means what? The velocity will increase. So the velocity keeps increasing, this term keeps increasing, eventually these will be equal to each other. Well, what happens when these are equal to each other? This equals zero, and dv dt equals zero, which means dv dt is zero, v is not changing anymore, v is constant. Well, what does that mean? It means that the person has reached what is called terminal velocity. Terminal velocity is the fastest the person will be falling. They speed up, speed up, speed up, but eventually they stop speeding up because at that point, their weight is balanced by the frictional force, the drag force, they don't speed up anymore. What if, for some reason, the person actually were falling faster than their terminal velocity? In that case, this term would be larger than that, this quantity would be negative, dv dt would be negative, which means v would slow down, v would decrease. So if the person were actually going at a higher speed than their terminal velocity, they would start to slow down. Now, how could that be possible? Well, you could imagine that uh, when the person jumps out, maybe imagine they, they curl up into a ball. They end up going very, very fast, but then they put their arms and legs out, increasing their drag, and they will actually start to slow down. They go from one, perhaps, larger terminal velocity to a smaller terminal velocity. Well, what would that value be? Well, let's stick some numbers in here and see if we can figure that out. Let's imagine that our parachutist has a mass of 60 kilograms and B has a value of 0.235 kilograms per meter. Let's see what we get for what's her terminal velocity. Well, terminal velocity will occur when the net force acting on her is zero, so that dv dt is zero, so there's no acceleration, the velocity is constant. So for this to be zero, we must have that mg must equal bv squared, or v squared equals mg over v. So what do we get for that? m is 60 kilograms, 
times g, 9.80 meters per second squared, divided by b, 0 0.235 kilograms per meter. And let's see, how, how do these units work out? Well, we have kilograms in the top, kilograms in the bottom. We have meters in the denominator of the denominator. Now, how would we get rid of that? If we multiply by meters over meters, then meters divided by meters would cancel, and we end up with meters times meters, meters squared. Meters squared per second squared, which makes sense. That's what we would expect for units of V squared. We multiply this out, we get 2.50 times 10 to the third meters squared per second squared, take the square root, we get V is equal to 50.0 meters per second. Very, very good. We'll say V sub T, that is her terminal velocity, V sub T. 50 meters per second. Okay, very, very good. Let's take a look at one more. Let's try another friction problem, and we're going to look at this in, in several different ways. Uh, let's imagine we have a 75 kilogram crate on an incline, a 15 degree incline, and there is a coefficient of static friction of 0 0.350, a coefficient of kinetic friction of 0 0.2, uh, 0 0.200. First, let's figure out what's going to happen with this crate. If it starts out stationary, what's it going to do? Is it going to stay there or will it start sliding? So let's draw a free body diagram. What forces are acting on the crate? Well, we've got weight, the weight is straight down, and the weight will be mg, or 75 kilograms times 9.80 meters per second squared, and that has a value of uh, 735 newtons. 735 newtons. What else? There is a normal force. Now, we've already seen problems like this. If we look at the motion, we know the motion is only going to be up or down the incline. It's not going to be perpendicular. So uh, the normal force will be mg cos theta. So we'll have the normal force is mg cos theta, or 75 kilograms times 9.80 meters per second squared times cosine of Theta is the angle of the incline, 15 degrees. It's supposed to be a 5, sorry. Multiply that out, and we get the normal force is 710 newtons. Okay? Now, what else is going to be acting on it? Well, the box is going to try, so to speak, try to slide down, so the frictional force is going to oppose that motion. The friction is going to be up the incline. Okay? So, what do we need to uh, compare? Looking at the forces in the direction along the incline, we need to compare the frictional force with the x component, let's say if we call this x, the component of the weight down the incline. We've already looked at that. We know that that's going to be the weight times sine of the angle, or mg sine theta. So, w sub x will be the weight times sine of theta, and in this case that's 15 degrees. So 735 newtons times sine of 15, that gives us 190 newtons. 190 newtons. So that's the component of the weight acting down the incline. We have to compare that to what frictional force? Well, what's the frictional force that can keep it stationary? That will be Fs, the static friction. And how large can the static frictional force be? Fs max. So we need to look at Fs max. Fs max. And what is Fs max? It is mu s times the normal force. Or, in this case, 0 0.350 times the normal force, which is 710 newtons, which leaves us with, in this case, 249 newtons. Okay, so what happens? Think about it for a second. Try to decide what's going to happen in this case. Compare whatever forces need to be compared and make a decision. 
We have the force down the incline is 190 newtons. The frictional force can be as large as 249 newtons. So yes, static friction is large enough to keep the crate stationary. So let me ask you, what is the frictional force? What, this is going to be a static frictional force. What is the value for Fs? It's not 249. It's not always the maximum. It's only as much as it needs to be, which in this case would be to balance the force down the incline, which is 190 newtons. Okay, there we go. So there's our static frictional force, 190 newtons. But now, let's imagine that someone comes along and wants to push this box, this crate, up the incline. Let me ask, how hard would the person have to push the box to start it moving? So how hard would they have to move or push to get it going? Well, let's think about that. What forces are acting on the crate now? Again, we have weight, and the weight is still 735 newtons. The normal force, because there are no other forces acting perpendicular to the incline, the normal force is still going to be mg cos theta. It's still going to be 710 newtons. We now have a pushing force, so I'm going to draw that in. There's a force acting up the incline. We'll call it F sub push, and that's what we're looking for. How hard does the person have to push to get the box moving, to start it moving? Now, what direction is the frictional force? The frictional force, because the box is going to perhaps start moving up the incline, the frictional force is going to oppose that and is now going to be down the incline. So the frictional force now is opposed to the motion up the incline. How much friction do we have? Well, we want to figure out how hard the person has to push to get it started moving, in other words, to overcome the static frictional force, the maximum value of the static frictional force, so Fs max. Okay, there we go. So what are the forces that are acting in the, let's say, the x direction in this, in this case? So the forces acting in the x direction will be the pushing force. We've got the Fs max acting down. But we also have the x component of the weight acting down. So not only does the person have to overcome friction, they've got to overcome the weight of the, the crate, the component of the weight acting down the incline. So we also have to subtract w sub x. That's the net force in the x direction. What's the minimum amount that the person would have to push to overcome that? It would be so that this is just barely greater than zero. In other words, we might say that it's, it's any amount larger, large enough to make this a positive number. So something larger than, than, uh, uh, than if this were equal to zero. So let's figure out what is the value to make this a zero. The pushing force would be equal to Fs max plus the component of the weight down the incline. So basically, the pushing force would have to be greater than that in order to start it moving. Well, what value do we get then? Fs max. Fs max is still mu s times the normal force. Even though it's uh, uh, opposing an upward force, even though the frictional force is acting down the incline, we still have the same value, 249 newtons. So this is 249 newtons plus w sub x, the component of the weight down the incline, which is still 190 newtons. And what do we get when we add those together? We get 439 newtons. Sorry about that. Someone's cutting the grass outside or something, or blowing. What we find is that the pushing force would have to be something larger than 439 newtons to get the object moving, to overcome the static frictional force. Okay, very, very good. Let's think about one more part to this. How hard would the person have to push to keep the, the, um, the crate moving? In that case, to keep it moving, what would the frictional force be that we're looking at? 
it would be the kinetic frictional force. So now we have to figure out what is the kinetic frictional force. Well, Fk is equal to mu k times the normal force, which is, for this problem, 0 0.200 times 710 newtons, which, <coughs> excuse me, leaves us with 142 newtons. So how hard would the person have to push to keep it moving? That would be so that F push minus, now this would be the kinetic frictional force, Fk minus W sub x equals zero. Keeping it moving at a constant speed means the acceleration is zero, so Ma would be zero, so this force would be zero. So what do we have? Well, now we'll just have the pushing force must be the kinetic frictional force plus the component of the weight down the incline. In other words, 142 newtons plus 190 newtons, which leaves us with a final value of 332 newtons. Okay, very, very good. We have done a number of different problems uh, with a number of different kinds of situations looking at Newton's laws, great. What we're going to do next time is we're going to start to look at a different way of solving problems, not just using F equals MA, but using a different approach, a very different approach. I'll see you then.